tragedy that will bring you to your knees. However, as we know, art renews and brings us back to life, uh, particularly to the elemental, both in nature and um, uh, to our communities, such as the effect of E.D. Jackson's. Or is in New York, not in Burlington. Um, language in the way that time occupies our days and nights, but with less doubt and uncertainty. For what is sung is the miracle and possibility of survival, redemption, rebirth, but only after, as we are doing now during this pandemic, taking stock, that inward effort that leads us back to each other's heart and the natural world. What one learns in her poems is that meaning does not once again reside outside ourselves, but is encoded in sensuous interaction and willful paying attention to what challenges us, as well as to the minute exactitudes. So much in life deadens us to the world around us. At least here are poems that you're about to hear that summon us back to the living. Dee Dee Jackson is the author of Moonjar. Her poems have appeared in the New Yorker, New England Review, Plowshares, and elsewhere. After having lived most of her life in Florida, she currently lives in South Burlington, Vermont, where she teaches creative writing at the University of Vermont. And, and please welcome her. Thank you. Thank you for that lovely introduction, Major. I never... Well, maybe I did one day think that you might introduce me, but I feel very, feel this very special. So thank you tonight. And thank you guys for all being here. And I, um, I just love looking around and seeing so many familiar faces too. And to be able to see people that I wouldn't necessarily be able to see if I were only in, in New York um, tonight. So it actually, I have friends joining me from Florida um, and elsewhere. So I, I, and I, I'm, I'm very appreciative of that. And I wanna thank Jason and John for asking me to read tonight. And I'm a huge fan of Jason's work. I think I've said that a million times, but maybe I ha I'll do it a million and one that I'm a super, super fan of Jason himself as a human being and then his work as well. So um, yeah, so I'm, I'm very excited to do this. I am gonna open my, the reading with a poem by Evan Bolin from the first book I read of hers um, in a time of violence. And I wish I could show this to you and you could see all my like, this is a good page. Like you could just see, this is why Major and I don't share books because I just write all over them and like take notes, but this was so important to me. And so hearing of her passing um, in um, this month or in April, it was April, it was April 27th, I think, um, was really difficult. And, um, and, and she just meant so much to so many people, um, particularly women writers. And this is a small poem, it's tiny, but I just felt it was appropriate to pay tribute to her and her passing. It's titled, This Moment. A neighborhood at dusk. Things are getting ready to happen out of sight. Stars and moths and rinds slanting around fruit. But not yet. One tree is black. One window is yellow as butter. A woman leans down to catch a child who has run into her arms this moment. Stars rise, moths flutter, apples sweeten in the dark. Um, I'm going to read, what I thought I would do is take a tour, because this feels like I can do this tonight, particularly um, I'm going to take a tour through the book itself. I'm going to read a couple poems from each section. And the book Moonjar, my book Moonjar is, um, it deals with being a survivor of suicide loss. Um, and then also this kind of coming to terms with, um, you know, the reality of that situation and then finding new love. And so I thought I'd read a handful of poems from each section. There's three sections. 
and then end on a couple poems that are new, that I've written that are new, um, actually since we've been social distancing. And I feel like one, I think I'm gonna read that I wrote um, actually yesterday and finished today. And that makes, I feel like it's a very scary thing to do, but I also feel like we're in times now where I don't care. <laughs> I'm putting it all out there. So um, I'm going to open with the poem that um, is my poem for the book. And I think it sets the, the tone and kind of everything, um, the themes that I, I write about. So it's a good poem to start off with, I think. And it's titled Signs for the Living. Sometimes after the last snow in May, after the red-winged blackbird clutches the spine of the cattail, after he leans forward, droops his wings and flashes his epaulets, I imagine shouldering the yellow center lines of the road. Near the recently thawed pond within a long channel of construction, a man holding a sign. One side says slow, the other stop. Joy and sorrow always run like parallel lines. Inside the house, when I leave the lights on, small white moths come like a collection of worship, pulsing their wings up and up the window, as if in a frenzied trance-like dance. Some dervishes, others the penitent on shaky knees. The first few years after my husband's suicide, I wanted to be the penitent. I thought I deserved all the pain I could feel. The drill of road work in late summer was a welcome grinding music. Now the yellow center lines are flung like braids behind me. Almost animal. I heard they no longer sew eyelids of the dead shut. At the morgue, I busied myself counting the lacerations on my husband's neck and wrists. I wore sunglasses and a light jacket and pressed my palm to his wrapped chest. After the dried blood was wiped from his face, his jaw was set with a piece of string. They tried to leave a natural appearance. I wanted to smooth his clothes. I wanted to clean his hair. His throat was a village. My palm an iron of matrimony. I wanted to burn the holding room, jar and sell the ashes. At home, the hours layered like moths. I didn't eat and slept some nights. This was my way of waging war. There was nothing left for me. I carried him on my back and over my shoulders. I carried him across my forehead and between my shins, but it didn't matter. He was going right into the fire. I should have been the one to prepare his body. Slip. The cat slips out the window. The thread slips past the eye. The sun slips into the stratus. The letter S slips past my tongue. The lead slips beyond the drop of the Y. A steel pyramid slipped in and out of utility knife. The blade slipped into the skin on wrist and neck. The whisper song of jays slips from beak to beak, tree to tree. He slipped down the bathroom wall. I slipped on ice I do not see. The temperature slips beyond zero. Our phone slips, our photo slips from its place on the frame. The river slips past the storm downed tree. I slipped past a wedge of light to enter the morgue. I let it slip, suicide. The blooms of the lilacs slip into a purple and white parade. At the end of the day, I slip out of my body. Um, so the second section in, in the book, um, I went to the island of Serpos. It sounds mythical in a way, but it's true. And I was there um, for a month. <laughs> and um, I'm just going to read one short poem from that section of these poems 
the the it's a long poem titled Racamilo, which is a warmed honey drink that is uh, you drink in Greece. But um, I don't know. I feel like this poem feels really timely now, even more so than um, than ever. So I thought I would read this one. This is the one I'll read from this section, and it's titled In the Morning. In the morning, the echo of the previous day lingers like a shadow on the kitchen wall. Someone will bring in the dead, will clean and mend wounds that will never heal, will set a table with cloth and silver for all to eat in memoriam. The silver will not be polished, and the dog will stare in the direction of the sea where all the answers sink like lures, shiny and brilliant, uselessly swaying like slowly nodding heads. And the third section. I'm gonna open with a poem titled, I also, I should say, one thing I wanna say is, um, I write about the seasons a lot. Nature finds its way into my work as well, but I write about the seasons and I notice that I think I have one, two, three, almost four poems on about spring. Can you tell I'm excited that it finally might be spring here in Vermont? <laughs> and I'm not joking when it says the last snow in May, it's true. <laughs> I'm still expecting another snow here, but um, uh, anyway, so that, I thought I'd pick some poems about the seasons. Listen. Like a hundred gray ears, the river stones are layered in a pile near the shed where morning doves slow their peck and bobble to listen to a chorus of listening. Small buds on the lilac perk up. A cardinal's torpedoed call comes in slow waves of four, round after round. It's a love call, a call to make him known to himself. The stones listen harder, decipher the song, attempt to offer back its echo, but fail. This is not a poem of coming spring. This is a poem well aware that gray flesh is dead flesh. All of the ripe listening comes at a cost. The first sky is in all skies. The first song is in all songs. Um, Ribelita, yeah, um, I don't need to explain too much about this poem, because even if you don't know what Ribelita is, it explains it in the poem, so I'm going to go ahead and just read it straight on. In a Tuscan farmhouse, I cook Ribelita, a peasant soup of white beans, crumbled bread, and kale, as the Campanile de San Biagio rings in the centuries. Though not Catholic, maybe not even a Christian, I kneel in the shadow of this church and look deep inside the sleeves of a sweater I've worn too many months. After taking his own life, the husband I knew burned in a box I chose from several boxes. I also chose his clothes, the urn, and in the end asked for him to look like death, not a false life. Yet here I am, considering a soup hundreds of years old, the golden altar of the Madonna de Bon Viaggio and the sound of bells in the lower fields near our farm. I know the path to the San Biagio like I know the roof of my mouth, bells like foil between my teeth, electric. The scent of footprints might confuse the dead, but each night I end up between the sheets Windows open in the last hour of lovemaking, among bed bugs and common centipedes. In my new husband's arms, trafficking old scars, I hear the prune plums fall from the trees. I will collect and skin them in the morning. All right, um, a couple new poems. So um, I'm a little obsessed with. I, I read this poem. I've read this poem out loud a couple times um, on this, on like 
Zoom readings now, but I'm obsessed with um, the the animals of Vermont. They're new to me. They're not like these giant palmetto bugs that I was used to living in Florida. And so when the wall's warm, all the spiders suddenly come alive here. And so I'm kind of fascinated with finding out which spiders what and what kinds what. And um, just last night, one came back across my desk um, and it's this type of spider. So this is, um, it's a philodrama day and it's the title of the poem. And this philodrama day is like this little crab-like spider. So it's like flat and kind of like wide, like a crab. Um, and apparently they, these spiders do bite, but they don't really want to bite. They don't really go after you. So I think it's safe that they're in our house, but I don't kill spiders ever. Anyway, um, so these, these next couple poems have been written um, since kind of being home. And so maybe that's why I'm spending a little more time thinking and looking at these details around me in ways that I guess I might have before, but definitely am now. Philodrama Day. A gray speckled spider curls at the edge of my desk lamp's shade after circumambulating the rim three times, like compassing the Earth's equator alone, the center a hot bulbed core. She slows, if on a clock at nine. Not a web weaver, she's sure to make a silk sack of eggs as soft as a lamb's ear and as white. But for now, she is still as time. Her funeral will not be held today or tomorrow. She is a wandering hunter, a child of the seasons. I have been here before, watching a life parallel to my own, waking with strange bites all over my body. Early spring. And as a, a line that opens with, um, from Louise Gluck, when I woke up, I was in a forest. And this is the poem that I wrote yesterday and today. Maybe the forest floor's earliest flowers are the way you make yourself known. Make me human when I forget I am. Then and there, begging for the sunrise, for the woodcock's funneled flight, for the shy gold thread to feed itself to the ruffled grouse. I like small kindnesses. Did I just lose you guys? Oh, that's weird. I lost the whole screen for a minute. Okay, good. I'm sorry. Is it okay if I start that one over? Yeah, yeah, you're totally uh, fine. We didn't lose anything, but yeah. Oh, good. Okay, like it went white and just said Zoom. That's, I thought, oh, sorry. I thought we were going to have a redo from last week. <laughs> like you're going to lose me. Okay. All right, I'll, I'll start over again. Okay, sorry. Redo. All right. Early spring. When I woke up, I was in a forest. Maybe the forest floors earliest flowers are the way you make yourself known. Make me human when I forget I am. Then and there begging for the sunrise, for the woodcock's funneled flight, for the shy gold thread to feed itself to the ruffled grouse. I like small kindnesses. I've waited a long time for the raw to finally soften into something hungry, like the mouth that is the grill of our car, embedded in it, a rose-breasted grosbeak, limp, crushed like wrapping paper, not yet hardened by death, a kill we never wanted. And because the ground was still mostly detritus of winter, his colors burned against the decay as I dislodged his body and placed it as if on an altar under the not yet budded willow, hoping his flash of red might be mistaken for red trillium, the stench of death, the brilliance. I'm gonna um, end on um, a poem that I wrote right, right away when we first started going into social distancing and I was considering 
what I'm grateful for and um, um, yeah, and trying to, as I still am right now, remain, you know, positive in um, these really difficult times and, and moments. So um, I'll end on that poem. I think it would be a good one to end on. I did write this poem on the Ides of March. Um, and I thought that was appropriate because I feel like, you know, the Ides of March historically was Caesar's assassination, but um, it just felt like a doomsday in a way to some extent. So. Um, Ides of March 2020. Two doves land in the moss below the feeder, sunbathe in the last light of an early spring day, then huddle on the lower branch of the ancient hackberry tree, where we wait to see them mate. By today, the newest plague has killed thousands in Italy, so any life is good life. The 2016 Verberti Dolba although not communion, feels sacred, as does our crackers and cheese, our hike under a biblically blue sky, our fire raging in its cage. When we return home, I have complained about so much for so often. How now do I love that tiny fellow chipmunk who on his hind legs checks the celestial movement of the sun before digging what I imagine are the Christian catacombs under our foundation. He has a mission, so should I. No rain today fell into the open graves of the dead, only a sunset in life as we know it. All right, thank you. Thank you all for listening. You can be clapping, right? <laughs> Great reading, wonderful reading. I'm I'm going to ask our friends John and Matthew mm -hmm. and Jason. Do we take a break here? Um, like, we, we do it. It's usually much shorter. I would say like maybe like two minutes. You know, a two minute break. Okay. Yeah. This okay, do, I, do I have time to go get it? All right. I'm going to put up the Venmo code. Oh, it's actually. J Jason, I saw there was it's Dennis Dennis Dash. Oh, did I put the wrong one in? Was it like did I say dash instead of underscore? Underscore. They put a Venmo code up. Oh yeah. no! I I had the the dash instead of the wait. I'm I put up the wrong thing. Um, oh my God, Nathaniel, honey. You put no, on, on the image. In, it's, on the it's image, it's correct. Stuffing wet, honey. Yeah. Okay. No, it's, it's a dash, really and I always do an underscore. And you're getting so. all over. All right. I'm, I'm just grabbing another drink, and as soon as I'm back up, you'll. This is this one's right. Something's happening. Something. Yeah. Daniel, I, I really. <laughs> something is, and you're gonna burn this corn. I'm telling you right now, it's gonna burn. I mean the rice. Thank God. That's us. Yeah, for me. That's me. As you take your break, please consider muting. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. It's okay, oh. Michelle. No, happy sorry, year here. Sorry, gonna burn. sorry. Oh my goodness. I no, happy year here, Michelle. Going on over here. I'm thrilled to be here. I keep telling my family, I just to want to hear the poems. <laughs> yeah, the corn. Oh, the rice. It's the rice, not the. the oh. <laughs> but anyway, but Didi, that was so beautiful. Thank you so much for your words. I can't tell you how in this crazy moment and in this crazy time, I'm so grateful. So, and thank you for that, getting me the. The FaceTime thing today that meant so much. I was like, I have to do this. Yeah. So. Yeah. Thank you. M. 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 M.